Tonight we're doing class called Restoring the Foundations. So this is the manual we use, probably done in the 90s or late 80s, uh, by uh, Chester and Betsy Kilstra in Florida. So uh, Alicia and I did this. We took people through the prophetic prayer counseling, which is a, sort of a nickname for it. Um, and we took through people through in, uh, when, we lit, when we were pastors in Louisiana. So uh, very, very powerful, thorough uh, counseling approach. So we've decided to put it into a classroom uh, method of teaching the whole course. So, um, so if you want to take notes, you can. We're going to have, of course, lots of scriptures. Um, but again, you can, uh, if you're taking, the taking it as a class, which we're encouraging you to do, then uh, Alicia will email you the link so you can watch the class again. So, because we're going to have probably six sessions or so. So, um, we went through this. So, this is uh, the breakdown of what we're going to be going through. So, I'm not going to really get into that because this is the layout. So, tonight we're here, sins of the fathers and resulting curses. And then next week we'll be doing soul, spirit, hurts as long as we get through this class. And then ungodly beliefs and demonic oppression. So. Everybody ready? Got their uh, seatbelts fastened? Already. <laughs> All right. So, uh, sins of the fathers and resulting curses. Sins of the fathers represents the accumulation of all sins committed by our ancestors. It is the heart tendency or iniquity that we inherit from our forefathers to rebel or to be disobedient against God's laws and commandments. It is the propensity or the pushing the nature of to sin. So it, propensity means to push you in that direction. Like if you don't feel like, like something's really pushing you from behind, that's actually what's happening. So there's a propensity to sin because of ancestral sin. In a particular way that represent perversion and twisted character. The accumulation of sin continues until God's conditions for repentance are met. So if you're born again, you become aware of sins, then you can confess those sins. And that's part of what we're going to be going through tonight. The ancestral sins and curses must be worked through and cleared out through repentance and forgiveness. Sins of the fathers include curses, vows, bitter root judgments, and ungodly soul ties, which we're going to try to get to all of that tonight. Oh. Um, God's point of view is that God sees man in terms of families, and he thinks in terms of generations. So we see always see generational curses, generational blessings, Okay, I'm the father of Abraham, Isaac, and family, generation after generation. So that's the way that God views us. Hebrews 7, 9 through 10, Levi received the blessing from Abraham's actions of tithing. In our culture, we see man very individualistically. So we see everything short. Like we actually call a generation now 10 years <laughs> because of the differences every 10 years, every decade. But a generation, of course, is 40 years, one generation. And right now there's three generations, like in the Coombs family. So those are the generations. But in our culture, we're very short, very short, you know, very short mindset. And we don't think generationally. So um, next year is the God of mercy is also the God of justice. Exodus 34, 6, 7. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, re rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. So uh, I think there's another scripture here about that too. Exodus 24 to 6. You shall not make for yourselves an image in the form of anything in the heaven above or the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate him, but showing love to a thousand generations for those who love me and keep my commandments. So you can see the, the cursing that can flow down, but also the blessing. God is saying... You see the comparison, three and four generations, a thousand generations of blessings. So we can access, how many of you want to access the blessings from God? Amen. Amen. So we have that access. And of course, these are Old Testament scriptures and our access is very different. But we get, uh, sin is dealt with a lot in the Old Testament. So when you go 
if you go through the prophetic prayer counseling as a ministry, um, we, we put this in here to show you the great, great grandfather, great, great grandparents are here. The grand or great, 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 greats and grandparents, your parents and then you. So if you look at four generations, this is how many people are involved. <laughs> so you're talking about the sins of all these people just on one side and all these people, grandparents in here. So that's a lot of sin. I won't say, can I get a good amen on that, okay? So, so, and then you've doubled that, okay? So, so you're looking at a lot of sin that can flow in. And then here you are, let's say you're first generation Christian. And you're going, what is going on? I've been a Christian for 10 years and all of a sudden, da, 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 like I'm, what, da, 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 da. So you've got all of these people pushing on you with their sin. At the same time, there's access for the blessing to flow. A lot of times when I'm giving a prophetic word or other people, they'll say, you know, I, I hear the Lord saying there's third generation back, there's, there was a, there's an apostle or a prophet or a pastor or whatever. So there is blessing there that you can access. Some, somebody else dug the well for you. So in this case, if it was all sin, you're drinking from a very polluted well. So a lot of times, depending on how you grew up in church or if you didn't grow up in church, if you did, we had this mindset, I used to call it the blanket theory, that the blood of Jesus covered all my sins. Yes, he does, but he covers the confessed sins. We have to confess our sins. So Amen. the blanket theory, like I used to hear in the 70s and 80s, was a blanket you threw over all the sins, but they were all just sticking up under the blanket. So we're, we've learned a lot, especially through the 90s and the, and the 2000s, where we need to identify sin so that we can confess those sins and repent and ask for forgiveness. So um, in this process, this session is designed specifically for ancestral sin. Okay, so um, some of the other things we look at is idolatry. And of course, God hates idolatry. It occurs whenever we put our trust in the things or situation more than we put our trust in God. So we, we don't look at ourselves in a, as an idolatrous culture, but really we are. We just don't set them up. Well, sometimes we do. We, in it, we had a joke in our uh, church. Uh, the coffee machine was one of the uh, altars. Everybody had to come to the altar before they went to church. And, you know, and I wasn't a big coffee drinker, so I made a lot of fun of it. So uh, I said, oh, look, everybody's going to the altar or to the shrine or, you know, and Oh, rub the shrine. You know, so we have our, because a lot of us say, and this is part of uh, the ungodly belief session, but it's also, you said, I can't start my day until I have my first cup of coffee. That's a curse. You've cursed, you're cursing yourself. So when we look at some of these things, you'll see like, we, we you know, we have a lot of this spiritual mindset, but we don't know how to apply it practically. So I'm going to, give you some jabs once in a while to say, oh, that's what it means, okay. And, and when it gets really down to it. Because we're used to thinking of Old Testament idolatry. But we have to think of Canadian idolatry, okay. We're not interested in what the Israelites did. We have to be interested in what we did, okay. So iniquity, a heart condition, an inner tendency of man to break God's heart. The tendency of the heart to rebel has been with man since Adam and Eve. Since sin has had its root in the heart condition of iniquity and rebellion. In the Bible, iniquity equals lawlessness, wickedness, depravity, unrighteousness, transgression, and perversion. Fathers, also mothers, grandparents, and entire families. So, which is where the uh, curses, sins of the fathers and the resulting curses come from. Then we have to look at self-sin. Uh, response to the setup of sins of our fathers and, and curses. It's how we respond to various pressures and temptations coming against us. Self-curses, sinful acts, ungodly beliefs, the hurts we carry inside, demonic influence, etc., in a godly way or an ungodly way. So, you know, we're, now we're in sort of the height of, you have to blame everything. You hear about lawsuits and, uh, you know, even as Christians, we've we got to watch that. We're not blaming everything, our actions on somebody else. Right. Now, when we're looking at sins of the fathers... We're talking about the propensity so that we're showing you things that will give you answers, not a reason to blame. Do you understand the difference? So you're going to get answers of why you feel like you're pushed in a certain direction. 
Okay, so that if there's a this strong sin nature that, and you're born again, spirit filled, and you're like, what is going on? Well, this is an area that we can address to give you answers. Okay, so we can't blame others for the way that we enter into sin. Yes. Amen. Right. Okay. <laughs> Huh? Right. So we're, we'll be going through. We've actually got uh, the prayers. Alicia printed up prayers for everybody to take home and also the lists. So you'll have some material to take home. Of course, it'll all be on YouTube. So um, if we look at Isaiah 64, 6, um, see, we're all under this iniquity and we all need a savior. Isaiah 64, 6 says, all of us have become like one who is unclean. And all of our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. <clears throat> Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. Each dies for his own sin. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, we look at this in the context. Deuteronomy 24.16 Parents are not to be put to death for their children, nor children put to death for their parents. Each will die for their own sin. So you're looking at the weight of sin in the Old Testament, okay? Mercy triumphs over justice, the Father's heart. Ezekiel 18:30 30-32. Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, each according to his conduct, declares the Lord God. Repent and turn away from all your transgressions, so that iniquity may not become a stumbling block to you. Cast away from all your transgressions which you have committed and make yourselves a, a new heart and a new spirit. For, well, for why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies, declares the Lord. Therefore, repent and live. Imagine, this is Old Testament. It sounds like a New Testament scripture. Okay, And they didn't even have Jesus then. For God requires what he provides. Requirements of the sacrificial system, the new covenant through Christ, Jesus. Confession and repentance are God's provision for us. That's not We don't hear that a lot these days. Okay? 1 John 1, 9, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is, this is very important in our culture that because we... God requires that we confess it because he knows he's, it's going to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. Okay? God has provided the way of freedom from all the effects of the sins of the fathers, the SOF. If you see SOF, sins of the fathers, SOFC, sins of the fathers and <coughs> resulting curses. And our own sin, it's appropriated by faith. Galatians 3.13, but Christ has rescued us from the curse and pronounced by the law. Cur the curse pronounced by the law, sorry. When he was hung on the cross, he took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing. For it is written in the scriptures, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Confessions of fathers and own sins. Leviticus 26, 40 through 42. But if they will confess their sins and the sins of their ancestors or their fathers, their unfaithfulness and their hostility towards me, which made me hostile towards them, so that I sent them into the land of their enemies. Then when their circumcised hearts are humbled and they pay for their sin, I will remember my covenant with Jacob and my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham, and I will remember the land. If you look in Daniel 9, 4 through 20, it's a long account. But the basic account is, you can see the amount of verse. It would be good for you for to look. I looked it up earlier. And uh, Daniel is confessing the sins of his fathers. He's going through and going through events and different things. And uh, part of verse 20 says, While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel. So even Daniel here was not only uh, looking at direct ancestor, he was looking at the entire uh, uh, Jewish population then. So, and, and their history there and confessing their sin. Okay, if... If uh, if there's if you if you know within your family that there's different cultures, you know, and you know some of the history of the cultures, you can confess the sin to break it, so that it doesn't flow down to your children and it stops flowing through to you. Amen. Yeah. 
So if you, even if you say, well, my family was never involved in that, but was your culture, like the Acadian culture, okay, with the different cultures that are represented here. Okay. You know, for, for my parents, it would be the Quebec culture and the England from uh, the English from England culture. So we know in England, they were very, uh, for years and years, they would go in to colonize countries. And the colonization was butchering other cultures. So mm -hmm. that's something that, I don't know how you'd see the effects of that, but if, the, if God was like, shake, let's say, give me dreams of invasions, I was like, what is this? Well, he's trying to tell me that there's, there, I need to pray to, to ask the Lord to forgive me and the sins of my fathers. Okay? And in the, I think it's the English that have the whole uh, Masonic. So, you know, that your grand, flows... Your great-grandfather. Right, so we, we stop. You understand? So if you know of things that are in your own culture, there's a chance it could be flowing to you, okay? All right? Appropriating the cross. Galatians three ten to 14. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. As it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly, no one who relies on the law is justified before God because the righteous shall live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says the person who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everything who is, who, who is hung on a tree. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given, the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles any Gentiles here? Through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Everybody say amen to that. Amen. To that. amen. So we because Jesus did what he did, it it we have the opportunity to get separated from curses. Amen. amen. Alright, so here's one of the handouts we have. We're gonna be shuffling and all the things that are going on. This is uh these are I know it's small because well, we have it so you can see it there. But these are all sins that, you know, years of ministry that uh, the, the Kilstras did. So they made up two handouts. There's two pages there. And there's all kinds of different, different kind of types of sins. So, for example, if you go through the prophetic prayer counseling, in your interview, we actually have these sheets and then we're checking things off. Okay, we see this. And then if we know of ancestral things in your culture, for example, then we're going through and checking them off. Okay? So you see all the categories here and then all the different types of sins. And when we go through the demonic oppression, I think it's like five pages. So, so it doesn't mean you'll have all these, but you'll see they're quite, some of them are quite general. Perfectionism, workaholism, cadence, slavery, slave trade, prejudice, success, failure, crisis. So we're looking, when we're taking you through the prophetic prayer counseling, for example, we're looking for patterns. Okay, so some, a lot of people don't even see the patterns in their grandparents, their parents, and themselves. They don't see it. So that's why it's good when you go through counseling that you, counselors like us, we could... We see the pattern. Oh, did you notice this? Okay, so it's a it's a it's a good tool to use. And then we we will have the prayer as well. So here, here's the prayer. So we'll hand that out. So you're not going through this? No, that's just. No, actually, How you do that on your own? Oh, okay. This one is for. But it's good that you explain a little bit, Peter. Yeah, you can go through. Yeah, do some of it because explain. Oh, well, we that. got a lot of material to go through. Well, we cannot. Just do half, and then we have another session. Because that's quite, in, you know, that's important for the people to. It's not demonic oppression; that's sins of the father. Yeah, the sin of the father. Yeah. Do you want to go through that? I mean, it's just a list. That's okay. It's pretty simple. Yeah, I know. She finds it hard to understand, so just explain it. Oh, I thought you said it's hard to understand. Okay. Yeah. I'll do a couple of examples. No. Yeah, a couple of examples. Examples. Okay. <laughs> so let's say we've taken somebody through and they would have given some kind of uh, 
like the first one, abandonment, rejection, desertion. So we're looking for, uh, let's say you're, we're taking notes in the ministry and they're, they were sent away like when they were 16 years old. And so that person would have received abandonment and rejection and the idea of desertion. So usually what happens, we're going to go through it a little bit later, is that there's um, judgments that are made. And we're going to get into that called bitter root judgments. So this pattern starts. See, a lot of people, for example, they look at, um, let's say, obesity in the family. And in our culture today, all they do is address that the fact that the person's heavy, not what caused it. Do you understand? So we don't look at that. We look at the spiritual cause of maybe obesity in the family. Let's say it's, it's overeating. So why did you overeat? Well, you maybe the child is only overeating because the parents overeat, and the parents are only overeating because the, the grandparents may have overate, but it started with the grandparents. So what took place? So we gave an example once uh, several months ago. One of the root causes of, let's say, excessive eating is self-hatred. So all the time you're trying to do weight loss programs to take care of a spiritual issue. That's why in some cases, weight loss programs will not work because you're not dealing with the root cause. If self-hatred, because um, overeating or comfort food or whatever is an example of uh, self-comfort. You're comforting yourself with food. But does food actually comfort you? Of course not. It just you just put on weight. <laughs> so you understand. So if you're not taking care of what's causing it, so these are some of the sins that you look at and say, well, how, bitter, resentful, unforgiveness. Well, how does that affect me? Well, bitterness, for example, biblically, it's one of the uh, root causes of, I think, some the intestine area cancer. So. Okay, well, wow, there's cancer in my family. Well, then should we look at possibly a <coughs> spiritual root? Okay, so that's why it's important to know, like, you know, these different things. Okay, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So when you're, that's why I say when we take people through the counseling, they don't even, they don't even make the connection. So, so sometimes we had this saying in, uh, in the counseling, if in doubt, cast it out. <laughs> okay, so if it, if it possibly re re resembles it, so there could be a chance, so yes, we'll check it off and take care of it. If, if, if you're casting out something and it's not there, so what? I mean, you're just aggravating the enemy. I don't mind aggravating the enemy. Okay, so, amen? Amen. amen. So, uh, here is one of the cards. We have everything in prayers and cards. I don't think that's the one we have to hand out. But here, see, I confess the sin of my ancestors, my parents, and my own sin of, and then we'll go abandonment, rejection, and desertion. So we use this prayer. Let's say the person, we have something checked off, every one of them checked off. So we're literally doing this prayer. If this is 15, this is 15, 30 times. So we're, you're confessing. Let's say we're taking Jermaine through. So she's confessing every one of these sins. Every single one of them. Okay, oh, and that's pretty common. Yeah. And it's, it's, see, I confess the sin of my ancestors, my parents, and my own sin of. A lot of times you'll start walking in the same sin. Okay? It's just like obesity. Except it's bitterness. Okay? The sin just keeps going on. Okay? I choose to forgive and release my ancestors for the sin, the curses, and the consequences in my life. Okay, and sometimes you'll see this, the uh, consequences. So we, in the prayer it says be specific if you see the consequences yourself. I ask you to forgive me, Lord, for this sin, for yielding to it and to the resulting curses. I receive your forgiveness. On the basis of your forgiveness, Lord, I choose to forgive myself for the involvement in this sin. I renounce the sin and curses of and then we repeat them again. I break this power from my life and from the lives of my descendants through the redemptive work of Christ on the cross. I receive God's freedom from the sin and from the 
resulting curses I receive. And then there we can put in like the opposite of abandonment, rejecting the desertion. The feeling of being loved. Okay, we, we've discussed here before the root cause of all addictive behavior is the need for love. Okay, so if you have a lot of alcoholism or addictive behavior in the family and you're praying out to cast the spirit out of addiction out, <laughs> all you're doing is casting a demon that may have entered in the addiction, but not the root cause, mm -hmm. which was the need for love. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so here you're replacing acceptance, love. Okay, feeling love. It's one thing to love somebody, but do they feel love? That's a whole other class that we've done. Okay, so called the Five Love Languages. It's a book you can pick up. It's an awesome book uh, you can pick up uh, at any ChristianBook.com or any Christian bookstore, if there are still some in New Brunswick. Okay, there's one in Fredericton, I think. All right. So curses. A curse is a penalty to be paid for breaking uh, one of God's laws. Thus the biblical meaning regarding God's law is the consequence that will occur because of disobedience and rebellion against God. Where do curses come from? God. Okay, the first place they come from is God. First curse is against the serpent and the land in Genesis chapter 3. Another place is Deuteronomy 11 verse 26 to 28. See, I'm setting before you a, today a blessing and a curse. The blessing if you listen or obey the commandments of, of the Lord your God, which I'm commanding you today. And the curse if you do not listen to the commandments of the Lord your God. Deuteronomy 23, 22. No one of illegitimate birth shall enter the assembly of the Lord. None of his descendants, even to the tenth generation, shall enter the assembly of the Lord. So, if there's illegitimacy in your family... And there, let's say there's a, there's a real struggle to enter the presence of God. Well, if you say, when I'm in church, I can never feel like I enter. And I'm, I, I, I never want to, you know, look at God. Let's say you're worshiping and everybody says, you know, let's all look towards heaven. Or you we're supposed to enter the uh, throne boldly. You can't boldly go with your head down. You, your head has to be up. And that has you have a really hard time with that and feel condemned. And So is it possible that there's illegitimacy in your family that's preventing you, that's, that's pushing you against you to enter the presence of God? So do you understand that's a pattern of illegitimacy that could come and that we take care at the cross? Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Where do curses come from? Others. Okay, right here. James 3, 9 and 10. With, must be talking about the tongue. Yes, yeah, with the tongue. With it we bless our Lord and Father. With it we curse men. Who have, made, who have been made in our likeness of God. From the same mouth comes both blessing and cursing. Curses can be placed on a whole family line. Example from Masonic. A great demonic oppression can result and the and the dedication is broken. Okay, so here's a uh, a sheet right out of the uh, manual, and then we during the session we are going to go through, and you're going to list curses that others have spoken over me. Okay, you're a failure and you'll never amount to anything. Okay, so how many of you can think of oh a curse? Yeah, my mother used to always say, you'll never. Mount anything, you'll never... Come on, guys, help me out here. What's some of the curses you oh, know? Oh, that's just temp talking. Yeah. You, you, you never know what you're talking about. or you're, you, You'll never be able to keep your room clean. You'll never... Yeah. You'll never or you'll always you're is always, a curse. Yeah. You're like, you're, you're always late. You'll never be on time. Yeah. So yeah. those are curses because they're not blessings. Mm -hmm. Okay, does that make sense? It's very, very mm -hmm. simple. And if you, when on your drive home, you'll go, oh my gosh, all I do is curse myself. Okay? Cur curses I have spoken over myself. Mm -hmm. I can never do anything right. Whenever I, da da da, I always, never. if you say always and never, <laughs> you're just speaking curses. Yeah. Okay? So, I never you understand? So, um, Curses, vows, and judgment I have spoken against others or authorities. So there's examples there. Men are 
da 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 okay so they give an example untrustworthy and will always fail me okay typically because of a father relationship my father never hugged me my mother never really wanted me churches are not a safe place to be those examples of curses spiritual leaders or pastors or apostles prophets whatever do not have the best interest in me in heart employers are only out to get for themselves i worked for an employer that always said that he said everybody's here to grab money they just even accused me of that to grab money you're just here to grab money then why do you keep that's hiring what people does. <laughs> that's what we work for so it but it was a curse okay do you understand and he believed that that's the only reason people came to work was to get his money instead of being a blessing here's a question for for you to think about if you're every one of you who are working or have may, maybe you're the boss and have employees if i said to you what is your greatest asset in your company be. some people are going to start going through their machinery i worked for a company that had a lot of machinery okay well what's the most valuable well we rebuilt the engine and da 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 da, da. and immediately you realize that they believe that their greatest asset is a machine not the people who run the machines so right there you're seeing probably curses and vows and things that were made generation so usually if you're speaking curses you were trained monkey see monkey do you saw it from your parents but then you got to watch how you now make curses okay my parents never they always criticized their bosses. Or some you know. people say, my back is killing me. I'm like, don't say right. that. Right. A lot of people say that. Mm -hmm. Oh, killing me. I don't, I don't say that. Once I started learning <laughs> about this, I don't curse myself. Yep. No amens on that one. I don't amen. curse myself. Yeah, amen. 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 We. Um, I've, been, I've been taught once, I'm using the I am, mm -hmm. is... Like I said, speak positive because the I am Christ is in all we do. So we say I am, we're putting a curse on ourselves because He's in all. He's the great I am. Mm -hmm. So we bind in whatever we say. Like, I am blessed mm -hmm. because I am Christ one. You get what I'm saying? A little bit. <laughs> Let me explain again. Just, no, it's okay. Okay. Yeah, it, you're talking about being blessing yourself. Being blessed and cursed because right. we would say, I am no good. Christ is the great mm -hmm. I am. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah. when we pertain ourselves to I am is in all, mm -hmm. so it becomes yes. legal to what we say to ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a, like an excuse. Yeah. I see. I get it. You would never curse God mm -hmm. with the things with your own cursing. All right. So. <laughs> so here's examples. Um, some things spoken by others. Okay. You'll never amount to a hill of beans. Okay, can become UGB is ungodly belief. You're a dummy. Spoken by authority figures. God will never bless you if you leave this church. Okay, that's a curse. <laughs> I'm sure pastors have said said that because that's why it's in the manual. Okay, so um, curses or thoughts over oneself. I'm just a lost cause. There's a verse in the Bible that says, "As a man think, thinketh, therefore he is." Okay. So if you, you meditate, there's one of the personalities that constantly what called ruminates at night. There's a disease now. It's a disease that you can get medication for called, um, what's, you can't sleep at night is called, I don't know, insomnia. insomnia. I have insomnia. No, you don't. You just, you got to shut your mind off. In the, in the States, uh, we live there, well, at least it's from there. I live there long enough where everything, I think it's crept into Canada too, Everything is a disease. Acid reflux, disease. I mean, when did heartburn become a disease? I had acid reflux, and uh, my father had it too. So that's a very good example. If, if I was strictly in the world, I would believe sincerely, my mother used to say sincerely wrong, that because my father had it and I had it, it's a disease. But what was really the issue? 
stress, fear, anxiety. Because I remember my dad had to tilt his bed, and because I remember I had to carry everything to tilt the bed up, because so your your stomach would be a little higher, and da da da, and all this and all this. And uh, you know, it's the food that you're eating. Mm-hmm. Well, I learned a long time ago that most acid reflux, and you're taking an uh, antacid, and you actually need acid in your stomach, mm-hmm. not too much acid and the purple pills and all that actually stops it actually said you know we stop the pumps from the acid pumps well they stop it so that to or to send it into overdrive to produce more acid what a lie we've been fed (laughs) and we're trying to reduce the acid well what you understand what happens when when you're stressed out it changes your chemistry in your body Mm -hmm. and it takes the acids away or whatever so you actually need more acid and you're taking these pills saying, i got to stop the acid. And guess what you're doing? You're praying, Father, reduce the acid in my stomach. And God's going, what? <laughs> you mean increase the acid, don't you? That's why your food's not digesting. Yeah. You understand? Like we've been fed a lie. And, yeah. and we get a revelation of these things that I, didn't, I did not have the disease of acid <laughs> reflux. I had the dis-ease of a stressful pattern. When I met Alicia, when we got married, my stress level was going like this. I was in my mid-20s, well, actually late 20s. And then when we got married, just like this and just leveled off. I fell asleep faster. I mean, it used to take me one to two hours to fall asleep all through my 20s. Wow. I could have blamed my parents. No, we fell asleep less than that. Yeah. So... <laughs> <laughs> so Alicia used to tease me and say, just calm down and yeah. like, you know, we've been married 20 years now, so she would, she falls asleep in minutes, so just, oh, and I'm just, I'm probably like 20 minutes now. I mean, it used to be hours, so not anymore. I don't have a disease. I had to learn to, to, to uh, do practical things, just wind down, shut, turn the lights down a little bit, don't have all this activity before I go to bed. You know, nowadays, everybody's on their phones, and it's stimulating. Mm-hmm. Anyways, mm-hmm. all right, carry on, carry on. So you see different examples there, and uh, there's a prayer. I forgive those who have cursed me with the spoken word that, and then you put the curse in. I ask you to forgive me, Lord, for receiving these curses and giving them place in my life. So then we go through the rest of the prayer, okay? And then the scripture that's there, it's hard to see, but Isaiah fifty four seventeen. no weapon formed against thee shall prosper. Every tongue that rises up against thee in judgment shall be condemned. So now you see a very practical use of these scriptures where there's been curses spoken against you, against you, against you, and now you know there's a good place for Isaiah 54, 17. Amen? Amen. All right. Bitter root judgment. This is so awesome. I hope I can do it justice. This is a teaching that's done by John and Paula Sanford. Uh, originally from Toronto, and they have Elijah House, a ministry that was, uh, I would say, booming, I guess, in the early late 70s, early 80s. This teaching that we saw online was done in 85. And you see all the results of the old dressing styles and all that's hilarious. All right. So bitter root judgment. This is a very real and active thing that the enemy uses. And we may have heard the scripture, but here's the scripture here. Hebrews 12, verse 15. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause and defile many. So we're going to go through what bitter, root judge, uh, bitter roots are. Bitter root judgments will, will grow inside of you and then, according to this scripture, it will defile many. So if you're, and I'll, show, I'll describe it there. So if you have a bitter root inside of you, and you get married, you're, you're defiling. I'm defiling Alicia with my bitter root. Okay, and she's in turn defiling me with hers. You understand? So sometimes you can see a cycle starting in marriage, especially. And it's usually a judgment of the parents, and we'll, we'll get into that. But uh, So it starts to defile. And what's the word defile mean in the Old Testament? It means to make unclean. So you're making others unclean. Let's say in your family, your children, your husband, your wife, whatever. Okay, in your direct family. So 
in general, bitter root judgments are based on God's laws. So we're going to look at some of the, 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 the most basic. And uh, the Sanfords give four, and I'm going to give you all four. So one of the root places where you look at bitter root judgments forming is against this scripture, Deuteronomy 5.16. Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you, so that you may live a long life and that it may go well with you in the land that the Lord is giving you. The laws describe actual reality for all people. God's laws are absolute. So it's really neat when the Sanfords are teaching this. They're, it does a good job describing that these laws will describe your life. And their laws. So um, he was giving an example. If I drop this book, what law is being demonstrated? Gravity. Gravity. Okay, so if you honor your father and your mother and it goes well with you, you are demonstrating the law. If you're dishonoring, you're just demonstrating the law. So uh, if I drop the book and it, and it uh, let's say this is glass and I drop it and it smashes all the people... Was the law or was God angry with the glass that broke? No, no. no it was just a law that was, that was being fulfilled. Like, you can't stop gravity. Well, unless you're in flight. So you're, you're having the, another law, the law of lift, okay, to fly. So, okay? So that, that means that law is for all of mankind. It doesn't matter if you're right. righteous or unrighteous. Very good point. So <laughs> the laws that we're going to just touch on a few... Uh, you see the next one here, the law of sowing and reaping. What you see, what you like, monkey see, monkey do is uh, another one. Like, okay, you, you're you're seeing it, and then you're doing it. So it's the same as same idea as reaping what you sow. So that is a law that's on the planet, and we see it, of course, in, in growing. But we, we apply it to ourselves as a law. Whatever you sow as a person, you will reap it. And in the world, they do that if you. If you give a smile, you'll receive a smile. Okay, and uh, so um, when you look at bitter root judgments, a lot of them are based on not honoring your parents. Where you can see things that are not going well for you, you may be able to find that you are, have not honored your parents in an area of your life. Okay. Can I ask you a question about mm -hmm. that? This is something that we have struggled with as my sister and my brothers and I. Um, when you have a parent that dishonors you all the time it mm -hmm. is really hard i just struggle with am i honoring am i not honoring i'm just trying to face the things that have happened and and this verse comes to mind all the time and we're, we struggle so much with it is acknowledging what happened dishonoring is i don't know backing off for space is that dishonoring yeah um i just find that that's a really Honoring your parents is kind of a broad, vague right. thing. Yeah, so when, when you look at that, it's really going to have to be a conversation with the Lord. Because you're going to, because to give a general answer would be really hard unless you know the history. Like, yeah, so if you're, if they're not honoring you, then how do you honor somebody that's, so in, in the Bible, we know that we love so I worked, for example, for somebody that was totally unlovable uh, because he was so mean to me. So, but I had to choose to love. So you love in an unlovable situation. Where does that love and where does this honor come from today in the New Covenant? From a renewed heart. Like in the Old Testament, they didn't have that chance. Okay, We have now the Holy Spirit living inside of us. So... Right, and we have the, the forgiveness. So the forgiveness in the Old Testament was very different than the, the forgiveness today because our forgiveness cleanses our hearts from so, all unrighteousness. So yeah. forgiving our parents, like the parents that they said that are not, they don't honor you, you can't honor them, but you love them and you forgive them because you don't want to be cursed. Right. Yeah. And it's not like it's treading not on thin either. ice. Like I you're not know. always, you know, what am I doing? They're doing the right, doing the right, doing the right thing. Our hearts will tell us those things, and the Holy Spirit. I went to a school. I went to my mother for years. Uh, like I healed from that first, and I got mad, and I got all these things, 
and I was able to forgive her. And like I followed my mother, and I was she would always be like the curse, you know. What are you doing? There was nothing ever she could say that was good. But I still loved her unconditionally. And you know, uh, almost uh, two years before she died, something happened. I told her of all the things that had happened. I got mad. I told her, and it, like from that day on, two days, two years before she died, uh, uh, there was love there. But how I, f how I forgive her, I, I was able, is because I knew of her past. Mm -hmm. She didn't have anything to give me. Mm -hmm. She had nothing to give me. And I passed that on to some of the things to my kids. That's how it was a generational curse. Like I mm. passed some things that my mother, sometimes my kids would say, I just have to say, I don't want to make it long. But my son would do a, a drop a, a glass of water and say, well, you're on your ass, how come you're doing that? stupid or oh, like, that, so. like that to, to him but that's why my, that's how my mother did that to me mm -hmm. so I was able because I did that I was able to forgive myself and forgive my mother mm -hmm. and she was in a home for a long time and, you know after a while and I would always go see her she was not good but <laughs> I loved and I respected her for being my mother because I had to remember there was good things the mother wasn't done not too much, but there was some. Mm. You know, oh. I have to say that. So that's how me I, I, I lived that. Well, yeah, mm -hmm. Jesus then. Yeah, yeah. It's not easy, but it's. It is possible if the Bible says normal, that we. So yeah. yeah. And we have it oh. easier, if you will, because we're in that a new covenant. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and we have support. That's the short answer. <laughs> <laughs> but it has to do with the heart. Your, your heart will motivate you to, to honor. Okay? So here are, the Sanfords go through these, and I thought I'd go through them. They use this as the four basic laws in counseling concerning bitter root judgments, and really with all counseling. So uh, Deuteronomy 5.16, honor your father and your mother, Romans 2.1. This, this one here, we all know this one, do not judge lest you be judged. So this is a very key scripture here as far as, uh, right here where it comes back to you. When you judge, it comes back to you. So at whatever point you judge the other, you are condemning yourself, yourself so not the other person. Yes. So when you judge, make a judgment, and we're going to go through some examples, mm -hmm. then you are condemning yourself. Okay? Oh Galatians 6, 7, we, we know this one. Okay, Whatever you sow, you'll reap. Now here's another law. We all know this. In Genesis, when... God created the, the earth when he was creating man and the, the animals. He said, what did he say? Go and increase. In the, Noah and the flood, go and increase. So everything is increased. You sow a seed and it increases mm -hmm. to produce more seed and be uh, uh, plant bearing and all those things. So the law of increase works in conjunction, in conjunction with the four basic laws of bitter judgment. So what that means is, is when you're sowing a sin that's this big, it grows and grows and grows and grows generation in your life and in generation after generation okay if you we we see, we teach this to teenagers and to parents whatever you do in moderation your children will do in excess okay if we see this in the, the hit the christian culture uh, probably about 10 to 15 years ago both here and in louisiana where we were all of a sudden you had all these christians drinking socially in bars so what i saw was we had these parents who would have a glass of wine with a meal let's say on special occasions but the kids see that and say my parents drink wine they don't say once every two years let's say the parents drank wine every once every two years all the kids see is that they drink wine so we've seen it with our own eyes in families, two generations, you can see one generation to the next. Now the young adult children are all drinking all the time. Yeah, that's right. That's true. The church, that's right. This is in the church. That's right. Spirit-filled people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we know and 
it actually destroyed the church, didn't it? Yeah, yeah well, right. there's one church that we used to go to. Yeah. The it church is, the doors are shut down, thank God. Because they, they started bringing alcohol <laughs> to home groups. Wow. Yes. And the church got a liquor license. Philip wasn't, Philip wasn't there. Yeah, you, we should be going. It's, it's the truth. Just outside of St. John. It's the truth. Philip called us in Africa. And what can I do? I said, get out. Can you and thank God the doors are closed. The doors are closed. St. John. They were, yeah. they were having, uh, they were letting people have parties at the bottom of the church with liquor. And like homosexuals could come and didn't matter who it was. Well, that church is closed now. Yeah. yeah. So. It's, it sounds like a cruel thing to say, but it's more cruel to lead Christians to hell yes, right. than to say, thank God this church is closed. Yeah. Those, those pastors have to answer to That's God right. for getting a liquor license in their church, not to me. Wow. You know, but we do need to, to, uh, to say this is wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And when Alicia and I were pastors, we could... Biblically, we could not tell you not to drink. No. Because you can't in the Bible. But culturally, we could say, look, we told our leaders, we had about 20 to 25 leaders. We said, if you drink, Alicia and I do not drink, will not drink. But if you drink, meaning wine, if you go get drunk, you're no longer a leader. You're out. You're, we're not even going to consider you. But if you choose to drink, please do it in secret. <laughs> If you go and have, you, look, you want to have it, special occasion, have your wine, I would never do it. So I don't like it personally. We would tell our leaders that. But if you want to, do it in secret. Don't invite other members of the church to drink with you. Because yeah. they look at you and say, well, Pastor Peter, geez, I wonder if he knows that their leaders are drinking. And all of a sudden, you've got accusation. Yeah. So we know scripturally, Paul talked about that. Don't put a stumbling block in front of people. Yeah. That's right. That you're the stumbling block. Your belief and your, mm. your wine. And, you know, it's like, well, it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. Like my aunt, who's a spirit-filled Christian from Quebec City, we were in Louisiana. She said, we were ordering a meal. She said, aren't you going to have any wine? <laughs> I said, no. We were pastors then. I said, no. She said, well, how are you going to digest your food? <laughs> And she's a godly woman. So in the Quebec culture, and it's so like the European culture, they drink wine. So that's why we can't get up as pastors or whatever and condemn. But we're not in Quebec. We're not Europeans here. You may have European descent. But if you're doing that and it's causing somebody to stumble and fall who's a young Christian. Because I've seen it with my own eyes. People wanting their, their non-alcoholic beer and all this and they're drinking. I have seen family members from that same family nosedive into to totally drift away from God. Anyways. All right. So Jesus walked into this law of increase to stop what you were due to reap because of your sin and ancestral sin, stepped in and paid for all of that so it wouldn't come to you, okay? So we must ask forgiveness for the sin we sowed by bringing our seeds sown to the cross where they must die and the reaping stops. Everybody say amen. amen. So there are things that you're due to reap that you may not even be aware of. That's why it's important to confess those sins. And then it stops. Okay? That's good news. So here's some examples of some bitter roots, uh, how bitter root judgment works. As a child or teen, you make the judgment, I will never yell at my kids like my mother does. Let's say you're 11 years old and your mother's standing in front of you, three or four of you, and just yelling. And inside of your heart, in your mind, you'll say, I will never do that. Treat my kids like my mother does. So... So what happens is, is that that is a judgment. And that judgment can form a bitter root inside of you and grow. And then it starts to defile you. And then, of course, when you're a mother yourself, what do you find yourself doing? Yelling at your kids. And you're thinking, how did I ever get to this point? Like I was never angry and I never planned on that. 
That's because there's a bitter root judgment that is, that is inside of you that is sin-based that is pushing you to sin that way because you are due to reap what you sowed in judgment. You are condemning yourself. Does that make sense? Yeah. Wow. Amen. All the lights go on. The elevator goes to the top floor. Okay? Okay, here's another one. Growing up in a house where your father always criticized you. Let's say you're a girl in the family. You make the judgment, the man will always criticize me. Okay, let's say you're 10 all the way through all your teenage years. Your father, all he does is criticize you. So your judgment becomes the man will always criticize me or the significant man in my life. You forget about that. You In your 20s, you go to school. Your life is awesome. Then you get married. Your husband is awesome. You're in ministry together, whatever the case is. And then... There's something inside of you, a judgment, that's starting to, you're starting to reap it. So it has now defiled your husband, and then it causes your husband, I've got it in quotes, causes him to always criticize you. Okay? Let's say the husband grew up in a house where uh, his mother was always overeating and he judged his mother for being heavy okay they get married and she gets criticized she goes to food he gets angry so you got two people operating in two different cycles where they have they have married somebody and they're causing each other to keep notching everything up he actually john sanford actually gives this story and it's of an actual couple and she would feel hurt and she would go to food. He would get angry because she keeps getting heavier and he would criticize her. So they kept notching each other up and everything just intensified. So all that was, that was not an, that was not an eating problem. That was a criticizing problem. And specifically a bitter root judgment that was growing and defiling. And the defilement just intensified. Okay, so when they go to the cross and confess the sin of judging back in their when they were kids and when they, with their parents, then the cycle gets broken. And guess what? It's like it's like the uh, two two warring families or two warring countries. All the arms, the guns, the cannons are all gone. There's no more weapons because they've been disarmed by Jesus. Okay, so. Now, there's something else that comes along built inside of these, uh, these young kids, okay? It's called bitter root expectancy. So, bitter root expectancy is built into a person because of repeated actions against, it, against you that you have passed judgment on. So, let's say you judged your father, okay, for criticizing you. So, your sin and judgment mindset develops an expectancy that you will experience the behavior again by the by the same person or by the same type of person. Okay, so let's say you're this 11 year old girl. You grow up being criticized. So your 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 judgment is the man will always criticize me. So guess what? You will begin to expect it hmm. from a significant man in your life. So the way that the Sanfords describe it is, he says to use a 70s term. You're sending out vibes, and you're vibing out this. Okay, so it, you're sending out a signal. You're gonna someday. You're gonna start criticizing me someday. You know, or all men, all they want is blah blank blank, and they're gonna take it from you. So you're in a marriage, and then you're sending out this signal all the time. The the husband, the man is always gonna want something from me. He's gonna take something from me. And in your mind, you're, it's going to happen someday. Sure enough, it happens. I knew it. I knew it was going to happen. That's because you set up an expectancy that, that was going to get fulfilled someday. Do you understand? So your bitter root expectancy was based on a judgment, and you're sending out an expectancy. So, so for example, people say, I never last in any kind of job. You know, I always get fired. So in your job, 
you have an expectancy to be fired. Hmm. So the devil comes in to create the circumstance for it to be fulfilled. Because that's not the word of God that's being fulfilled. Those are curses. Who fulfills curses? The enemy does. Right? He takes our words and fulfills them as curses. God's not taking notes going, okay, okay, angels, you know what to do. Curse the finances. Go curse their bodies. No, the, God is not cursing. He, you're enabling the enemy to do that. Amen. Everybody go like this, okay? <laughs> right? You're sending out curses. It's the enemy that releases his demons to do that, not angels. Okay, so, so we have to watch that we're not having an expectancy. And you say, well, it's always happened that way. <laughs> well, it what was your expectation? <laughs> okay, exactly. if it happened once, happened twice, you say, well, there's an, you know, that's the way it, God is. That's what God does to me. Every, every job I take. The word of God doesn't apply to me. I'm not blessed going in, going out. All I do is go out. I never get blessed coming wow. in. <laughs> okay, right. There's curses. So we can't, we can't blame God for that. Maybe there is sins of the fathers in this case. There's a propensity for job losses. So in the notes, okay, job loss. Job got fired. My grandfather got fired. My father got fired. Okay, well, then there's a pattern. There's a sin pattern there that you're walking out. Yeah. Break it with the, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay? Stop. All right. What time is it? Quarter after eight. Uh, do you want to finish? We just have, I think we have ungodly soul ties. Yeah, two more slides. All right. This is heavy duty stuff right here. Yes, Lord. It is. Soul ties. Without reading everything here. We've taught this in different places, and it's um, very, very powerful. And soul ties are typically uh, of a sexual nature. Okay, and any kind of, typically it's that, it's any, any relationship, typically, for example, let's say you're a teenager and you, you're having sex. Let's say there's 10 people you have sex with. The way each time you're doing that, because the Bible's clear, the two become one flesh. And you say, well, that's not marriage. What's the only place that God has designed sex to be in? Yeah, marriage. marriage. So, you know, we, we had to start teaching teenagers and young adults and some adults too, because we grew up in a culture that said, if you love somebody, it's okay to have sex with them. So sex became an expression of love. But is sex an expression of love? No, of course not. It's an expression of marriage. Oh. Okay, so sex is not an expression of love. I used to say that when I was passing. I said, if it was, I'd have a bed in my office. I love you. Let's hop in bed. You say, well, that's silly. No, it's not. If you, by definition, call sex an expression of love, then where does, where does love stop? Okay, in abuse situations, you had an abusive father and did those things. Well, that was not love. That's perversion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Dysfunctional. Okay, that's abuse. So sex is not an expression of love. It's an expression of marriage. So in soul ties, every time that there's sexual partners or whatever, you are forming an ungodly soul tie. This is what it looks like. Okay? And then in the natural and in the spiritual, we're doing this. So what happens is, in the act of sex, you've got two people becoming one. And then you pull them apart. Some of you is here. Some of this person is there on you. Because, you understand, like, it's, it's forming identity. That's Let's say... Woman, I think, yeah. it's, it's both. It's, it's both. Oh, yeah. So you typically see... You typically see, typically see a lot of the results in a woman, yeah. but a soul tie is a soul tie. Yeah. Because, let's say, because, you know, the two are becoming one. It's, it's not a subject we're going to get in too deeply right now, but you're having the two become one. Like, do you ever notice sometimes husband and wives later in life tend to look like each other? Yeah. Well, why is that? Because the two have become one. That's I don't a. Look like that. <laughs> 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 I 
take the, take that off the recording, please. <laughs> There, there are exceptions. There are exceptions. So the two become one. So let's say 10 people you slept with. Okay? The bonding ability is there. It gets broken. The bonding ability is there. It gets broken. It gets broken. It, it, by, the, by that time, it totally weakens. So a lot of Christians find themselves in a healthy marriage, godly person, all that, their lives have been totally turned around for Christ. And then they come together with a godly husband and they don't, like, what's what's happening? I don't feel the connection. That's because that bonding ability needs to be restored. So what happens is, is those soul ties are feeding you. Like some, you, you see it a lot in women, that they can't break away from this boyfriend. That is a soul tie that we have the legal right to break every soul tie, destroy them, not break them, destroy them, cut them off, and it stops this propensity to sin in a, in a different way or to be pushed or pulled in a certain way from this other person. So we take the blood of Jesus and sever those, those ties, and then we have a prayer that we, that we take you through uh, for that. So Another example is a, a parent and a child the child is like a surrogate parent and there's a soul tie so when they get married they never really leave their parents did you hear that Uh, with the parent and the child so that's a non-sexual relationship but it's heavy heavy control okay the the so there's a soul tie that's formed you'll see that sometimes in adult children when we took the soul ties with them the, the senders they even went to say you can have a soul ties with a credit card you can't, you, you know, to your views. Like they were giving a lot of examples that afternoon. Yeah. That's years ago when they did that. So a soul tie is something that you can get away from. <laughs> so it could be, there could be a lot of different ones, but the strongest one that we've seen is sexual relationships. So. Okay, so they give, being linked with the wrong people can keep us in bondage, often unknowingly. So that's a soul tie. Okay, witchcraft. Let's say you're, if you're, we've seen it before, not very often, but where we've seen it in girls more often, where there's a witch controlling, like occultically, other girls. Okay, so that's a soul tie that needs to be broken because that witch feels like they have a legal right to access you. Okay, so soul tie, another word for soul tie would be access to you. Okay, no. I don't, you're not going to have that access, okay? It could be even in, in, a, in a witchcraft sense, you can see it in uh, especially charismatic churches sometimes where there's witchcraft praying, witchcraft access. These pastors feel like they have this control, this proper, it's actually an improper access to you. No, absolutely not. That can, that can be a soul tie. See, a soul tie is not voluntary. It's not a voluntary thing. Somebody, we used to call it putting like a, a hook in you like somebody casts a line and they they try to reel you in mm-hmm. well they're creating a soul tie with you mm-hmm. you understand it's so it's an ungodly tie like i have a soul tie with alicia but that's a godly soul tie mm-hmm. okay it's not an ungodly We've one we've seen it in churches with with women in the church developing a soul tie for the pastor yeah right. we have to mm-hmm. deal with that yeah. right so it's good for pastors to counsel with their wives. Alicia and I did always did counseling together. Or if I had to counsel a woman, the door was open to my office. Yeah. And there was a staff person right in the other room there. So so here's, a, here's the prayer for breaking soul ties. Father, in the name of Jesus, I submit myself completely to you. I confess all of my emotional and sexual sins as well as my ungodly soul ties. I choose to forgive each person that I have been involved with in any wrong way. I ask you, Lord, to forgive me for the sin that resulted in ungodly ungodly ties. Lord, I receive your forgiveness. Thank you for forgiving me and cleansing me. I choose to forgive myself, to no longer be angry at myself, hate myself, or punish myself. Lord, I break my ungodly soul ties with, and then name the person or people. Okay? So we've had people that couldn't remember who they had slept with. So they'd say the person at the party when I was 
18 or whatever. Okay, so, you know, there's grace there for you to be able to break those ties. I release myself from them. I release them from me. As I do this, Lord, I pray that you will cause them to all be all be all that you want them to be and that you cause me to be all that you want me to be. Lord, please cleanse my mind from all memories of ungodly unions so that I am totally free to give myself to you and to my mate. I renounce and cancel the assignments of all evil spirits attempting to maintain these ungodly soul ties. Thank you, Lord, for restoring my soul. Let me walk in holiness by your grace. In Jesus' name. Okay, that, there's another part of the prayer that we used to have was, I'm sure it's in our manual somewhere. It, it was a prayer that released angels to go get the broke, fragmented parts, I think it was, of my heart, you know, uh, on all those people. Wow. And bring them back to you. That's a powerful prayer. Let's all stand up together as we close. And... Um, no. So we'll we'll pray. We'll just pray. We'll pray. Uh, I'll pray right now. Just lift up your hands. We'll pray this prayer concerning soul ties, just to begin to stir things up, so that if you feel like, wow, I haven't been able to bond, and I have, you know, if there's some issues there, then we'll we'll ask the Lord, His grace to move in that area right now. So Father, in Jesus' name. We acknowledge you and acknowledge the power of the Holy Spirit. And Father, I just ask that a grace would come that you will begin to send out your angels right now to retrieve the fragmented pieces of our heart and our spirit that was meant to be with us, but that we in, in our sin handed over to somebody else unknowingly. So Father, I now speak that restoration will begin to take place. And Lord, that they would have the time and the, the memories, Lord, to be able to, to confess these sins and begin to, to cover these things truly with the blood of Jesus. So, Father, we thank you that this power is available to us in this new covenant. Our covenant is a better covenant, Lord, that we can cover every one of these issues. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Yeah, where's that yellow one? On the back there. Yeah, so did you get the handout or? Thank you, Father. I'm going to just put some worship on, and then if you'd like ministry, you can stay where you are.